Well, we are continuing our study on the book of Luke called A Historical Study on the Book of Luke. This is teaching number 41. It's called John the Baptist Warns Israel About the Day of Wrath. This is part two. And uh, this study is going to come out of Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 20. And I want to start off by going back to Luke chapter 1 and reading verse 80, which says this, And the child, that's John the Baptist, <clears throat> grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. And that's something to keep in mind when we're reading uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the earthly ministry of Jesus was specifically to the nation of Israel. I mean, he did interact with Gentiles. He had an influence and an impact on the Gentiles. But remember, he said, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of Israel, don't go to the Samaritans. Uh, and then right before his ascension, he sends his disciples, his apostles, then to the nations. So in the early uh, chapters of Luke, throughout the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's important to understand that the audience that Jesus is communicating with is the nation of Israel. It's very, very important to understand. So what we have here is John the Baptist was in the wilderness until he appeared public publicly to Israel. So that's important for us to understand. Now, Let's look at Luke chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Now, we'll look at you brood of vipers later in our study. But I want you to notice that not only was his audience the people of Israel, but he's proclaiming a message about a coming wrath. We can understand more about this coming wrath in Luke 21, 20 through 24. And we looked a lot about the coming wrath in part one. But let's read again. This We read it in our previous study, but let's read it again. Luke 20, 20 through 24. This is the words of Jesus. He said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, that's the Roman armies, <clears throat> you will know that its desolation is near. Desolation means total destruction uh, of the city of Israel. Jesus also used the word desolate in Matthew chapter 23, I think verse 38, 39, when he talked about Jerusalem would become desolate or destroyed. That's a word that's used over and over again in the Jewish scriptures to talk about Jerusalem becoming desolate or desolation coming on Jerusalem for their violations of the law of Moses. So Luke 20, 20 through 24, Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation or destruction is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city of Jerusalem get out and let those in the country not enter the city. And normally people would run into the city uh, when um, armies were coming in on their city. And Jesus is saying, don't go into the city. That city is going to be destroyed. Desolation is coming on Jerusalem. Leave the city. And he says this, for this is the time of, the NIV says punishment. Uh, the New King James Version uses the word uh, vengeance. This is the time of vengeance in fulfillment of all that has been written. So the time of vengeance, we have to go back to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 25, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, 41, and 43, when God uses the word vengeance upon the nation of Israel, upon the people of Israel, the land of Israel, the cities of Israel, the temple, telling them that because of their violations of the law of Moses, their continued violations, their refusal to repent of their violations, that vengeance was going to come upon the nation of Israel. So this vengeance that's being described by Jesus in Luke 21, 20 through 24, is the final vengeance in the last days of Israel. Typically, when we read the phrase last days in the Bible, we think end of time. It's not what it's referring to. It's referring to the last days of Old Covenant 
Israel, <clears throat> this time of vengeance in fulfillment of all that has been written in the Jewish scriptures, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, by the prophets describing this final judgment. And Jesus goes on to say, how dreadful, talking about the great and terrible or the great and dreadful day of the Lord that was foretold in Joel chapter 2, verse 11, Joel chapter 2, verse 31, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, all dealing with Israel under the law of Moses in these last days. <clears throat> also, it's what's being de told and described by John the Baptist. Jesus used the phrase, the great tribulation. That's the same thing uh, in Matthew 24, 21 through 29. So how dreadful it, this time of vengeance, will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land, talking about the land of Israel, and wrath against this people, meaning the, the Jewish people. And specifically, the Jewish people of first century Old Covenant Israel, who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, who, who conspired to have him crucified, and then who also the first century Old Covenant Israel, Old, Old Covenant unbelieving Israel, not only did they conspire against Jesus, but they had many believers in Jesus who were also Jewish. They had them killed or flogged or beat. So Jesus says, the time of vengeance will be when they fall by the sword. That's judgment. This word sword is used uh, in the Jewish scriptures to describe judgment upon the nation of Israel and other nations by another nation. So they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. This is right out of the Jewish scriptures, right out of Deuteronomy 28 through 32, Leviticus chapter 26. It's exactly what God said would happen because of the violations against the law of Moses. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So this coming wrath that John the Baptist was talking about, and in Luke chapter 3, Jesus is talking about it in Luke chapter 21, 20 through 24. So the wrath was foretold by John the Baptist, was foretold by Jesus, and fulfilled in Revelation in AD 70 when the Roman armies destroyed Jerusalem. You can also look in Luke chapter 19, verses 43 and 44. Jesus talks about armies surrounding Jerusalem and building an encampment around Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, if you want to look and learn more about AD 70, it's not taught a lot in churches, and that's very unfortunate because it's one of the greatest and most significant events if we're to understand the Bible. Um, go to the Grace Reach website, gracereach.org. Um, go to blogs, go to topics, click on AD 70. I've got an article there with links to help you learn more about AD 70 so that you'll see the significance and the importance of why AD 70 matters because Jesus is talking about AD 70 in Luke chapter 21 in Luke chapter 19, 43 and 44. Now, <clears throat> the wrath that Jesus said would happen in the land of Israel and to the people of Israel is recorded in Revelation. Revelation is foretelling as well, the coming wrath that would come upon the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, its people in AD 70. Look at Revelation 6, 15 through 17. This is out of the New King James Version. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Jesus. So the wrath of the Lamb is the wrath of Jesus toward unbelieving Israel for their killing of believers. So you have in Revelation 6, as you read in Revelation 6, you have you have believers who are praying for the for the avenging of their blood. They're under the altar in symbolism. They're praying. 
And so the book of Revelation records the wrath of the Lamb against unbelieving first century Israel. So let's read again, uh, Revelation 6, 15 through 17. We'll pick up, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. That's the same wrath that John the Baptist talked about in Luke 3. It's the same wrath that Jesus talked about in Luke 21 through 24. For the great day of his wrath has come. And again, that's the Roman Jewish war. That's the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. So the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? That's a quotation from Malachi 3, 1 through 2 that describes the great and dreadful or the terrible day of the Lord. All right. So Revelation 6, 15 through 17 is the same wrath foretold by John the Baptist. It's the same wrath foretold by Jesus. So with this understanding, let's review uh, just a bit on part one of John the Baptist warns Israel about the day of wrath. And in part one, we looked at Malachi chapter four, verses five through six, which reads this way. See, I will send the prophet Elijah. That's John the Baptist. I will send the prophet Elijah to you, the nation of Israel before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. So the great and dreadful day of the Lord is the wrath spoken of about uh, by John the Baptist in Luke 3. It's the wrath spoken of by Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. It's the wrath, wrath of the Lamb in Revelation 6. So I will send the prophet Elijah, being John the Baptist, to you, the nation of Israel, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land of Israel with total destruction, desolation. And that's what Jesus was referring to at the end of Matthew chapter 23. It's the same desolation he, was, he spoke about in Luke chapter 21. 20 through 24. All right. Matthew 4, 1 through 4 says this. Surely the day is coming. That's the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, that's those who believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the son of righteousness, that's Jesus, will rise with healing in its uh, will rise with healing in its rays, and you, those who believe, will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. That's going out from Jerusalem. They're not going to be a part of the judgment that happened in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. They're going to go out. They were going uh, to be saved, and they were. <clears throat> then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day being the day of the dreadful day of the Lord, which was AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. When I act, says the Lord Almighty. And then continuing to read uh, Malachi chapter 4, 1 through 4, says this, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Herob for all Israel. So the judgment is directly connected to the law of Moses and the violations of the law by the people of Israel, the continued violations. Look at Leviticus 26, 25. And I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. So that's avenge or to bring vengeance on you, the nation of Israel, for the breaking of the covenant. And notice he says, I will bring the sword. Remember, Jesus used the word sword in Luke 20 or Luke 21, 20 through 24. When describing the Roman armies that would surround Jerusalem in AD 70 and bring judgment on Jerusalem. The Bible connects together. So one of the things that's really important for us to do is to make all these connections. And as we make the connections, then the story of the Bible and the parts of the Bible that we're reading become much clearer because we're no longer guessing about their meaning. We're actually putting all the pieces together and we're showing, here's what this means. Look in Deuteronomy 29, 24 through 28. All the nations will ask, 
after destruction and desolation comes to Israel, why has the Lord done this to this land, being the land of Israel? Why this fierce burning anger toward the nation of Israel? And the answer will be, it is because the people abandoned the covenant of the Lord. That's the old covenant of law. The God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt, they went off and they worshiped other gods. Remember the first commandment, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Well, before Moses was even coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, they were already worshiping the demonic gods. And the answer will be, it is because this people abandoned the covenant of the Lord and the God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. And they went off and worshiped other gods and bowed down to them, gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore, the Lord's anger burned against this land, the land of Israel, so that he brought on it the land of Israel, which is the same land that the book of Revelation has taken place on. It's the same land, uh, Luke chapter 20, verses 21 through 24, is taken place on. Therefore, the Lord's anger burned against the land of Israel, the so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book, the book of the law of Moses. In furious anger and in great wrath, there it is again. So wrath is used by John the Baptist in Luke 3. Wrath is used by Jesus in Luke 21, 20 through 24. Wrath is used, the great uh, wrath of the Lamb is used in Revelation 6. It's all describing judgment and wrath upon Israel for their violations of the old covenant of law. That's why we know that the book of Revelation is not in the future, because the judgments that we see in the book of Revelation are all directly tied to the old covenant law of Moses. That covenant doesn't exist anymore. The new covenant is in place. Therefore, Revelation cannot be in the future. For Revelation to be in the future, the old covenant of law would have to be reinstalled and would have to replace the new covenant of grace. And that's not going to happen. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. So, this happened twice in Israel's history. The first time they were uprooted was in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. Daniel was taken as captivity, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo taken into captivity. Uh, they were dispersed into the nations uh, of the world at that point in time. The second time that it happened was AD 70, when Rome destroyed Israel and the people of Israel were either killed or they were taken as slaves into, into the nations. All right, which is exactly, again, what Jesus is talking about in Luke 20, Luke 21, 23, 24. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 16 and 17, God said they will forsake me, they being Israel under the old covenant of law. Uh, they will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. And in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. That's desolate. They will become desolate, the total destruction. Look in Deuteronomy 32, 22. This is the Christian Standard Bible. For fire has been kindled. Fire represents judgment. Fire has been kindled because of my anger and burns to the depth, depths of Sheol. It devours the land of Israel and its produce and scorches the foundations of the mountains. And then Deuteronomy 32, 35. Their day of disaster is near and their doom rushes upon them. All right. <clears throat> now, we have to understand... Leviticus 26, we have to understand Deuteronomy 28 through 32 if we're going to understand the prophets in the Bible, um, Isaiah through Malachi. The prophets are all going back into Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 30, uh, 28 through 32. That's where, their, that's where their message is founded in the judgments of the law. They're always referring back to that. One of these prophets is Malachi. And so what we have in Malachi 1 through 4 describes the coming judgment upon Israel 
for their continued violations against the law of Moses. It's the, it's the second major judgment. The first major judgment was by Babylon. The second major judgment that Malachi is referring to would be carried out by Rome. And just of interest, Daniel chapter 2 has a, has a statue that has been dreamed about by Nebuchadnezzar. And the statue represents four physical nations, Babylon, the Mede-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, and in the fourth kingdom of iron mixed with clay. I think that is the kingdom of Rome mixed with corrupt Israel that, that was taking place, uh, that, that was alive and well during the time that Jesus was alive and after he was alive leading up to AD 70. So when Malachi is talking about the destruction to come, it's referring to that fourth kingdom of the dream. That's who's going to carry out that destruction is Rome, iron, on the clay, unbelieving Israel. So let's look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. This is out of the Berean Standard Bible. This is the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. So when we read Malachi, we have to understand it's a message to the nation of Israel. Remember, John the Baptist publicly appeared to Israel, proclaiming the wrath that Malachi said was coming. All right, same message, same group of people, two different prophets. Malachi proclaimed it, and then John the Baptist proclaimed it. Malachi 3, 1 through 2, I will send my messenger, that's John the Baptist, who will prepare the way before me, me being Jesus, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, it's the old covenant of law, who, who you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when, he's appear, when he appears? It's the day of judgment. It's, it's the wrath of the Lamb. It's Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Now look at Malachi 3, 17 through 18. On the day when I act, that's the great and dreadful day of the Lord, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possessions. I will spare them. That's the believers in Jesus. That's the Jewish believers in Jesus. Some people call that the remnant, the small part of the Jewish people who believed. Just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you again will see the distinction between the righteous, that's the believers in Christ who are declared righteous by faith, the Jewish believers in Christ, and the wicked, those who rejected Jesus, between those who serve God and those who do not. And then Malachi 4, 1 through 6, we've already read, but let's read this again. Surely the day is coming. That's the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's the great tribulation. It's the wrath of the Lamb. Malachi 4, 1 through 6, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming. Uh, and that day that is coming will set them on fire. Judgment, uh, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Now, remember this phrase, root or a branch, and some of the words coming out of Malachi because John the Baptist repeats them. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. And he goes on to talk about this great and terrible day of the Lord uh, that's coming upon the wicked. All right. Again, it's tied to the law of Moses. I will send the prophet Elijah. This is how the, Malachi chapter 4 concludes. I will send the prophet Elijah to you, Israel, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to the parents, or else I will come and strike the land of Israel with total destruction. And that's exactly what did occur. So the book of Malachi was written about 430 BC. John the Baptist began his ministry to Israel about AD 27. So it had been roughly about 400 years since the people of Israel had heard from God. And during this 400 years, they continued in the, their violations against the law of Moses. The people and the leaders became corrupt. And so God was kindling his final fire of judgment against Old Covenant, first century Jerusalem. But before his judgment, he sent John the Baptist, 
to warn them of the wrath to come, to call them to repent, and to seek cleansing and forgiveness of sins. So we have John the Baptist proclaiming to Israel the coming wrath and providing them a way not to fall under the judgment of the wrath. So let's pick up with John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, 7 through 10. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized. Now, baptism was symbolic of the people confessing their sins and being forgiven and cleansed from them. It was purely symbolism. We're going to look next week that, that the baptism of John was actually pointing to the person of Christ and to the cross of Jesus who took away sins. And we're, going to, we're going to see that in our next study. So Luke 3, 7 through 10, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized, uh, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees that goes directly back to Malachi. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire of judgment. So Matthew gives us more context about the audience that John the Baptist was address addressing. Now, we know the audience was the nation of Israel because that's who he publicly appeared to. And that's who the judgment message was for. So let's read what Matthew says <clears throat> about this. Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. People went out to, to him, John the Baptist, from Jerusalem. And remember, he's in the wilderness. People went out to John the Baptist from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, John said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire of judgment. So, question is this, who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were a group of religious people in Israel, deeply devoted to obeying the law of Moses, so they could escape wrath and experience salvation. The Pharisees understood that righteousness is required to escape the wrath and to experience salvation. That's really clear in the Jewish scriptures. They also understood, based upon Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, that the standard for righteousness was the law of Moses. So for a person to be declared righteous by God, they would have to obey the law of Moses. So the Pharisees made it their daily commitment and their life devotion to obeying the law of Moses so that they would escape judgment and so they would experience eternal life. And they prided themselves on their, quote, ability to obey the law, which they didn't obey the law. They were lawbreakers, and Jesus makes that very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. So the Pharisees also placed heavy burdens on the people to keep them from disobeying the law of Moses. And again, the Pharisees prided themselves in their law keeping while looking down in judgment upon others. Uh, the Pharisees believed they had achieved righteousness through obedience to the law. And the Pharisees proclaimed that they had not disobeyed the law. And therefore, they were not in need of confessing their sins or being baptized because those who were confessing sins and being baptized were admitting they were sinners or admitting they were lawbreakers. And the Pharisees would never make such an admittance since their whole life was dedicated to obeying the law. So we also find in the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that the Pharisees were in opposition to Jesus. And we see this opposition slowly begin to mount and to increase as we go from one chapter to the next, one chapter to the next, to the next. Now, Jesus, just prior to his crucifixion, in Matthew chapter 23, 
pronounced seven woes upon the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, telling them that Jerusalem would become desolate. Jerusalem would be destroyed. And the Pharisees understood exactly what he meant by that, that any time that was mentioned, the desolation of Jerusalem, it was in accordance to the violations of the law of Moses committed by the people of Israel. And Jesus then in Matthew 24 explains how that desolation would occur. He explains it in Luke chapter 21 as well. Now, who were the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees were mostly a political group who were in disagreement with the Pharisees theologically. However, together, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they form what's known as the Sanhedrin. You see references uh, to that in, in the scriptures, which was the ruling assembly over Israel as allowed by Rome. And what unified the Sadducees and the Pharisees was their intense hatred for Jesus. So they united against Jesus and they called for his crucifixion. Now, why did John the Baptist call the Pharisees and the Sadducees a brood of vipers? Well, the word brood in the Greek means offspring. So they were the offspring of a serpent. They were the offspring of a snake. Jesus referred to the Pharisees as a brood of vipers, meaning the offspring of a serpent or a snake. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, you brood of vipers, you being the Pharisees, how can you who are evil say anything good? So you see this conflict that's growing and mounting between the Pharisees and Jesus. Jesus calls them a brood of vipers. John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers. Jesus calls them a brood of vipers one more time in Matthew chapter 23, 33 through 38. Things has really heated up between Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus knew that they were plotting against him, conspiring against him, seeking to have him crucified. Um, in, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen calls it a murder that he's talking to the Sanhedrin and he tells the Sanhedrin made up of Pharisees and Sadducees that they murdered the Messiah. So Matthew 23, 33 through 38, you snakes, Jesus said, you brood of vipers, how will you, that's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, escape being condemned to hell? Now, the Greek word there is not the word for hell. The Greek word there is the word Gehenna. It's a real place. It's, it's a pronoun. Uh, and Gehenna was a real place in Jerusalem where trash and dead bodies were burned. In Old Covenant Jerusalem, Gehenna became symbolic for the judgment of the unrighteous. You can go into, for example, uh, Bible Hub. Go to, to, to that very verse in Matthew 23. Click on it. And it'll take you and it'll show you the word that's used there. So Jesus is using the word Gihana here. That's the, that's the word he said. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would have understood exactly what he meant, that they themselves were, were going to be judged, that they were going into the, quote, fires of Gihana. J the judgment of Gihana is what he's saying, this judgment that's coming upon the nation of Israel for their violations to the law of Moses. Therefore, I, Jesus, am sending you, Israel, prophets and sages and teachers. So before this judgment came, before the wrath came, Jesus sent into the nation of Israel his apostles. He sent Paul. He sent uh, others. And, and you can read about that in the book of Acts. All these people who are going into the nation of Israel and into the other nations to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to warn of judgment to come. And here's what Jesus says. Therefore, I, Jesus, am sending you, Israel, prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them, you, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, will kill and crucify. Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. All right. Jesus also talks about this in Matthew 10. He also talks about it in John chapter 15, verse 18 through chapter 16, verse 4. 
Therefore, I, Jesus, am sending you, Israel, prophets, sages, and teachers. Some of them, you, Pharisees and Jewish leaders, will quill, kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues. That's the synagogues is where the Jewish people met. And the, and, and the synagogues refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul would always go into the synagogues when he was in going in the cities and he would try to proclaim that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. We do see the Thessalonians, uh, some of them believed he was the Messiah. Some of the Bereans believed he was the Messiah. Uh, but most of the time um, he was rejected. And uh, at some point, even in Thessalonica, I'm pretty sure that's Acts maybe 17, uh, they were after Paul, the Jewish unbelievers, the Jewish leaders. Uh, and this is what Jesus is describing. What Jesus is talking about in Matthew, when he talks about others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town, we see that taking place in the book of Acts. And so upon you, Israel, first century, unbelieving, old covenant Israel, who rejected Jesus as the Messiah and who killed believers in Christ, uh, a fellow Jewish people who were believers in Jesus, to that group of people, Jesus said, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. He's describing judgment here. The earth, earth is land as, as well, the land of Israel. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, first century, unbelieving, Christ-rejecting, Christian-killing, first century Israel, Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation, the generation that Jesus is talking to at that point in time. And it came upon them in AD 70. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house, your temple is left to you desolate. Now, what does that mean? God had left the city of Jerusalem. God had left the temple in Jerusalem. We find in the early ministry of Jesus, he goes into the temple, he turns over tables, and he calls up my father's house. The end of the ministry of Jesus is no longer my father's house. It's your house and your house. The temple is about to be left to you desolate. It's going to be destroyed. That's happened in AD 70. There's no coming temple that's going to be rebuilt in a future generation. That's only going to be destroyed by God again. Th that, that's not going to happen. This has already taken place. Now, the Pharisees were the offspring of their father, the devil. They were a brood of vipers, right? <clears throat> Look what Jesus said in John 8, 44. Because that's who Jesus was talking to in, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. You are of your father, the devil, is what he's saying there. He's already communicated to them that uh, prior to uh, the end of his ministry. <clears throat> and we see that. Uh, happening in John 8, 44, Jesus said to them, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires, which was what? To murder Jesus, to kill Jesus. They were teaming up with Satan to kill Jesus. That's why the whole Jerusalem had become corrupt. That's why there was so much demonic activity in the land of Israel. Satan had taken over the land. And, and only a remnant of people believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And that whole land of Israel was, had become corrupt, and it was going to be left desolate all the way down to the temple in Jerusalem. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It describes the devil as Satan, the ancient serpent. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. Look at Genesis 3.15. This is where this ancient serpent is first seen in the scriptures. And I'll put enmity between you, that's the serpent, that's Satan, that's the devil, and the woman. Between your offspring and who was the offspring of the serpent? The Pharisees, the teachers of the law. 
They were the brood of vipers. They were the offspring. So your offspring, your brood of vipers, uh, there's going to be enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, the brood of vipers, the Pharisees, and hers, uh, Jesus. There's going to be conflict, enmity between the woman giving birth to Jesus and Satan giving birth to the corrupt Jewish culture and the corrupt Jewish leadership that we see taking place during the days of Jesus and after the days of Jesus. He, Jesus, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So with all that background, let's return to Luke chapter 3, Luke 3, 7 through 10. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Now we know who that is. That's the Pharisees. That's the offspring of the serpent, the offspring of Satan. Uh, it's the Pharisees who were teaming up with Satan to have Jesus murdered. Who warned you to flee the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe of judgment is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So he talks about repentance here. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. They repented and they were baptized. So repentance was admitting their sinful acts of breaking the law of Moses. Repentance was part of the law of Moses, where Jewish people would confess their violations against the law and then be baptized as symbolism for, for temporary forgiveness and cleansing from sins. In the Jewish scriptures, the, word, the words wash and washings are used. So baptism, washed, washings, all the same thing in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews, I think it's chapter 9. Uh, some versions use the word bab baptisms. Some versions use the word washings. Either way, they were just symbolic of, of forgiveness and cleansing of sins until Jesus came and provided complete cleansing and forgiveness of sins. So the Jewish people would demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance, admitting their sins, confessing their sins, acknowledging their need for forgiveness and cleansing, being baptized. Then the Jewish people would demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance by participating in good works. So that through repentance, the Jewish people would escape the wrath to come upon first century law-based Israel for their violations against the law. And I think it's Matthew chapter 20, where those who were admitting and confessing their sins were the prostitutes and the tax collectors, all right? Just, just two of the groups, among others. But it specifically mentions that in Matthew 20, I believe. Now, the phrase, we have Abraham as our father, don't, what John the Baptist was saying, uh, some people believe that because Abraham, they were in the line, the, the biological and the physical line of Abraham, they would escape judgment. So some of the Jewish people believe that because they were physically or biologically connected to Abraham, they would automatically be saved from the wrath to come when the righteous would experience salvation and the wicked would experience wrath. However, the true offspring of Abraham were those who had the spiritual faith of Abraham, not those who had the physical blood of Abraham. You can read about that in John 8, 41 through 47, Romans chapter 4, and Galatians chapter 3. John the Baptist also mentioned stones. The stones referred to by John could be referring to the Gentiles who shared in the faith of Abraham, but did not share in his blood. It was the faith of Abraham, which is faith in Jesus, that results in righteousness. And righteous people escape the judgment and unrighteous experience the judgment. The righteous experience eternal life. And again, Romans chapter 4. And Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes about that. All right, let's continue reading Luke 3, Luke 3, 7 through 10. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, again, you brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the coming wrath. We'll skip down where it says, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So let's take a look at this. The axe is already at the root of the trees, represents the soon-to-come judgment or the wrath, which is the dreadful and terrible day of the Lord. 
upon first century Israel for their violations against the law of Moses. We find that same language right in Malachi. The trees represented the Jewish people of the first century who were in danger of the soon coming wrath. And this is the wrath foretold by Malachi, proclaimed by John the Baptist. It's also the wrath foretold by Jesus and recorded in the book of Revelation that was fulfilled in AD 70. It goes on to say, John the Baptist says, Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be thrown into the fire, meaning judgment. So in the words of John the Baptist, as well as in Malachi, a tree was symbolic for people. It was imagery. The people of Israel who did not repent of their violations to the law of Moses and demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance through good fruit, doing what is morally correct, what is lovingly correct, would be cut down in judgment. So it, it wasn't the good fruit that allowed them to escape judgment. It was their repentance. But they demonstrated that they truly had repented of their law-based violations by good works. Okay. Um, so they would demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance through good fruit. Um, those, let's say, the people of Israel who did not repent of their violations to the law of Moses and demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance through good fruit, they would be cut down in judgment. That's the axe cutting down the trees. They would be thrown into the fire of judgment. That's the Gihana that Jesus talked about in Matthew 23 which is the wrath prophesied by Malachi, foretold by John the Baptist and by Jesus. And that was recorded in the book of Revelation and ultimately was fulfilled in AD 70, thrown into the fire. The word fire is used both physically and symbolically throughout the Jewish scriptures as judgment. So what I would encourage you to do is go on the Grace Reach website, go to gracereach.org, click on the orange teaching resource button, click on the uh, um, It'll take you to a blue page. Click on the book of Luke. Go down to teaching number 41. Click on the notes. And I have a lot of verses where fire is used both physically and symbolically as judgment in the Jewish scriptures. Because John the Baptist is not creating something new here. He, he, he's, he's doing what the prophets did in the Jewish scriptures. He's He's describing judgment in the terms of fire. Or you can go to the Blue Letter Bible. You can put in the word fire, search the word fire, look at all the references, and you'll see that it's, it's, both, it's both physically and symbolically many times in the Jewish scriptures uh, to, to, uh, for judgment uh, to come. Now, so John the Baptist, when he uses the word fire, is referring to the fire of judgment as foretold by Malachi. Again, look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Surely the day, that's the great and terrible day of the Lord against Israel for their violations of the law of Moses. Surely the day is coming. And here it is. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and the evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming. The great and terrible day of the Lord or the great tribulation. Jesus referred to it as in Matthew. It will set them on fire. So this is, this is John the Baptist's message. And look, look what Malachi says and then compare it with what John the Baptist says. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So that's the same imagery that John the Baptist used, talking about the judgment to come. They're going to be chopped down, so to speak, cut down in judgment. And that was AD 70. It was the destruction of Israel, the cities, the land, the livestock, the city of Jerusalem and the temple. Total destruction. Total desolation of Israel as described initially in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And we looked at a lot of this in part one of John the Baptist warns Israel about the coming wrath. So the judgment against Israel for violations against the law of Moses was about to come upon first century Israel. John the Baptist was warning them about it. Some of the people of Israel responded through the confession of sins, baptism and repentance. They asked John, what should they do to demonstrate the genuineness of their repentance or their sorrow for their sins and making amends for their sins under the law of Moses, therefore bringing forth good fruit and performing good deeds? What should we do then? We find this in Luke 3, 10 through 14. 
what should we do then since producing good fruit because the ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, then what should we do? The crowd asked. And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came out to be baptized. And they said, teacher, they asked, what should we do? And John said, don't collect any more than you're required to. And he told them, uh, that's what he told them. And, and then some soldiers, and these aren't the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers weren't under the law of Moses. They're not coming out to escape the judgment for violations to the law. These are the Jewish soldiers. You can read about the Jewish soldiers in Luke 22, 4, Luke twenty two fifty two, 52, John 18, 3, John 18, 12, Acts chapter 4, verse 1, Acts chapter 5, verse 21. Then some soldiers, being the Jewish soldiers, asked John, and what should we do? And John replied, don't extort money and do not accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Luke 3, 15 through 20, the people of Israel were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah, the Christ. You can read more about that in John chapter 4 and in John chapter 7 about the Savior King, the Savior of the world who was prophesied in the Jewish scriptures. You can read about it in Luke chapter 24 about the two men on the road to Emmaus, the people were wondering if Jesus might be, or if John was the Messiah, the Christ. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Just make a note here, uh, Acts chapter 13. I can't remember what, exactly what scriptures, uh, but it's in Paul's message in the Jewish synagogue that he's in, in Pisidian Antioch. He talks about the same thing that John just said. Um, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So they're all wondering, is John the Messiah? And John said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Servants would untie the straps of the sandals of those they served. So what John is saying is that he's not even worthy to be the very servant of Jesus. He, that's the Messiah, that's Jesus, will baptize you, means he, he will... He will immerse you in first century Israel, believing Israel. He will immerse you with the Holy Spirit, meaning Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to live within believers. We see this in Acts 2. We see this in uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon the Jews. We see it in Acts 8 when it came upon the Samaritans. That's Jews and Gentiles. We see the Holy Spirit in Acts 10 when the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles. Uh, we see in Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 6, God sending the Holy Spirit to live in believers. So John saying that the Messiah is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire is judgment. Bab whenever we hear the word baptize, a lot of times we think water. And understandably so, that's how it's used so often. But the word baptize in Greek simply means to dip into. For example, when Jesus was in the upper room and he says, the one who dips their bread into the cup is the one that's going to betray me. He uses the, the Greek word for baptize there. And it's, it simply means to dip into, to immerse in. All right. So the Messiah is going to baptize with fire. Remember, fire represents judgment in the context. And so Jesus was talking about judgment in Luke chapter 21. 21 through 24. That's the fire of judgment that was coming upon the nation of Israel for their violations to the law of Moses, which happened in AD 66 through AD 70. Here's the Messiah's, the Messiah's winnowing fork, which was used to separate wheat and chaff, is in his hand. He's coming to bring judgment. It is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat. That's the righteous ones. That's those who had repented and believed he was the Messiah. The Messiah gathers them, the wheat, into his born, but he will burn up the shaft. That's the fire. That's the judgment. The shaft are the unrighteous ones who did not repent and who rejected Jesus as the Christ. All right. He will burn them up with shaft with unquenchable fire, meaning that this judgment that's coming, that came upon first century Israel, 
21st century unbelieving Israel for the rejection of Christ and their killing of other believers in Jesus who were Jewish, that judgment was unquenchable. That judgment could not be stopped. It was coming and it couldn't be stopped. And with many other words, John exhorted the people of Israel and proclaimed the good news or the Greek word, the message to them. Now, th this message was for the believer, they're going to escape judgment. For the unbeliever, they're going to experience judgment. All right, let's finish with Luke 3.20. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. So who is Herod the Tetrarch? And he's also known as Herod Antipas uh, in the scriptures. The Herod family was a ruling family in the Roman Empire. Herod the Tetrarch was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great had all the male children, two years and younger, killed by the Roman soldiers when he tried to kill the child Jesus. Herod the Tetrarch ruled over Galilee after his father, Herod the Great, died and split the region uh, into four parts. And that's what a Tetrarch is. It's, it's, it's a fourth of a region. Herod the Tetrarch ruled over one of the regions. Interesting facts here. Herod is mentioned in the Bible in Matthew 14, 1 through 12, Mark 6, 14 through 29, Luke 13, 31 through 33, Mark 3, 6, Mark 8, 25, and Mark 12 through 13. Um, the Pharisees conspired with the Herodians. That's those who backed Herod to have Jesus arrested and crucified. And then in Luke 23, 1 through 12, Pilate and Herod met. And then we see that Herod, this is Herod the Tetrarch, and his soldiers mock Jesus. So who is Herodias? Herodias was the wife of Philip, the half-brother of Herod the Tetrarch. Herodias divorced Philip and married Herod. Herodias' daughter asked for the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. That the, that's in Matthew 14, 1 through 12. So we're going to end our study here tonight. We're going to pick up next week with Jesus being revealed to the nation of Israel 